Got it? Everything going across? And recorder's good. And everything's recording. I want to make Jimmy happy. This morning, Brother Lumen and Jimmy are headed back today from uh, Mexico. Tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow? Oh, okay. Well, they're headed somewhere, and then they'll be back tomorrow night. <laughs> be back tomorrow night at some point. All right. Thanks to those of you who are tuning in. Internet, appreciate you being with us today, those who will. All right. Today, I just want to share some thoughts that will kind of continue. Uh, the last time that I shared on a Sunday morning, and it's, it's what I've been looking at uh, everywhere I've been, kind of the, the podcast or the Wednesday sessions, and it has to do with chapters in Romans, uh, chapters 5 through 8, and we're just kind of making our way through those chapters, referring as we go to other chapters in the letter and other letters of Paul and different ones, but to me, these four chapters set forth such a wonderful uh, view of our salvation, and a view that, although I'd heard it for years, I'd misunderstood, and I think uh, many of us have misunderstood it, mis misapplied it, misinterpreted, and the Lord is bringing in some things, and that's what I want to talk about some today, or may hopefully get to it. Uh, you see this distinction, but there's a, a portion of Scripture that has been so misunderstood that it's been dispensationalized to a point where there's hardly any meaning in it at all for those of us who are in Christ. So I want to look at uh, those uh, verses as well. But just to set kind of a foundation to go on, when we looked at chapter 5, I think the last time on Sunday morning, we were looking at kind of a contrast that Paul deals with between two men and that contrast I have kind of diagrammed here on the board and I want to read a few verses just to put that in front of us and that's chapter 5 of Romans verse 12 wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Now these words are very important as we go through and, and get to the chapter and verses I want to get to uh, by the end of this in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Because it has everything to do what Paul is saying in these chapters. 1 Corinthians 15 has been so misinterpreted to where even though it's talking about the resurrection, we still have a tendency to think resurrection in, in sense of something that is not a present, uh, ongoing work of God in the soul. And because of the presence of the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. And so when uh, we read 1 Corinthians 15, we, we kind of take it out of the context of everything else. So what I want to do is show it in the context of these chapters. So these words, sin and death, uh, are very important uh, when we look at that as well. As one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for, all, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned. From Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, 
who is the figure of him that was to come. And then he begins to talk about how uh, we can go into verse 17, and for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more. And this is the much more that he's always addressing. It's much more because in this second man that he's referring to, in the new man, in Christ himself, we don't just have a picture of this, we have the absolute intention of God realized and bestowed to the soul. Not just a testimony of what's coming because this, as he says, he was a figure of him that was to come. And the reason Adam is looked at as a figure of him that was to come is because in this contrast, he's showing that in Adam, God was demonstrating a picture that would be absolutely realized in Christ, just no, not in the negative sense, but in the positive sense of grace, where sin and death reigned in one, now life and righteousness and peace reign in one. So you have a, you have a, a, a state being described here, much more they that receive the abundance of grace. This is the abounding grace he's speaking of at the end of this chapter and of the gift of righteousness, and isn't that, that, that word, the gift of righteousness. And we overlook words like that because we've been so programmed, even whatever, you know, whoever, we've been programmed to think righteousness is an achievement or righteousness is still a work in progress. Righteousness is a person who lives in your soul or he doesn't. And that's the point. Because what he's addressing here is not some ongoing procedure, but a definite determined state that is not determined by you, but a man. A man whose seed you're born of. Uh, because one man's determined the state of all in sin and death. The, all they had to do, they did not have to do anything. He said it, they, they didn't have to sin after the same similitude as Adam's transgression to become sinners. All they had to do was what? Be born of this seed and death and sin and condemnation and every other word that is used in the scripture to describe that state was already there because the seed that determined that state was there. Now, however... Uh, Unfair that may sound when we're looking at the negative side with the Adamic creation. It is the most beautiful picture of the grace of God when you see it in the light of this. In Christ and a new creation. Where what do you have to do to be holy and righteous? Or I like to say it this way. What do you have to do for righteousness and holiness and peace with God? And a per perfect unbreakable relationship to God to actually be your condition and your state be born of this seed that's why when Nicodemus approaches Jesus he doesn't give him steps he says you must be born again because he's addressing to this Pharisee to this man who is coming to him by night the most necessary thing for him in his state and that is another life another seed. You must be born from above. You can't be born of an earthly seed and work your way to the above. You have to be born from above so that that seed that is now in you by the grace of God has already determined where you are and the state you have. It's never been an achievement. It's never been something God looks at man to achieve. You see that when he gives the law. He doesn't look at man and says, now do it. He is describing his grace the whole time and describing a son in view of which he is dealing with these people the entire time because it was pointing them. It gave them a hope, an expectation that there would be a life that would come and live in them as, a, as the divine reality they had no hope of achieving while yet in this man. Even though they did all of the religious stuff, religious stuff is not enough. Religious stuff is not enough here either. What determines everything here is not your religious works. 
And I've said this before, and you know, it, it's very difficult, and this is just kind of leading us up to where we're going, but it's very difficult for people to hear it because of all the things that we've added to the picture in, in religion through the millennia. Uh, if you look at how absolute of a statement that Paul is describing in these chapters, you realize that the seed determines everything here. And we like in the world and in Christianity to have our levels. We like to have achievements. We like to have our plateaus, our levels, our climbing. So you do this and you reach this level. And even we call it deeper life or whatever. There's no such thing as deeper life. There's one life. Now the depths of that life are eternal. Absolutely. But there's one life. There's not a deeper life you get to and then you get to this level and this le level. I remember a lady doing that with the, <laughs> and I've heard it preached, you know, the 30, 60, 100 fold was levels. Outer court, inner court, holy of holies, levels. It's not. Uh, with, this, with this view, it's become a ridiculous thought to even think those things. Um, but here, here's the thing. Down in the world, we look at this man who is very successful and he's probably a philanthropist and gives to people and we think that's the best of, of mankind. And then we look at this man here and we say he's in the gutter. He's got a needle sticking out of his arm. We say that's the worst of mankind. But the fact is they're the same because they're of the same seed. If they're not born again, they're dead. They have no life. Doesn't matter how it looks, how it works. And, and, and the Lord even clarified a little more in probably a more offensive picture for some of us. And that is, here's a man in an alleyway with a needle sticking out of his arm, a drug addict nobody even cares about. And here's a baby in a crib that's never done anything. And they're of the same seed, regardless. That's how absolute this state is. Here's how absolute the state is here. Doesn't matter if you've been born 50 years, born again, or born yesterday. The same life, the same reality is in you. You don't, you don't come in. It, it's the whole, uh, and John Cassara was talking to me about this, and this is a perfect illustration. It never even occurred to me, but we were talking about it during the conference, and it was this, you know, when the, and then the guy was looking for laborers, and he, they agreed to a penny a day for his labor, for the labor of, of working with this man. And so these people are working all these hours and then he looks for more. They come in later and he says, a penny a day? Yeah, a penny a day. They come in later, they agree to the same thing. The people come in, there's one hour left in the work day. He says, a penny a day? Yes, a penny a day. At the end of the work day, at the end of their labors, he gives every man the same thing, the same wage. Why? Because that was the agreement. One wage. There's one gift, one wage, one fullness, one measure. God has given unto all men the measure of faith. You don't get more because you qualify for more. Now, although some griped and argued about, hey, this guy hadn't been here but an hour and he gets the same wage I do, absolutely. And that's the same thing we're saying here. Doesn't matter. The same wage. Why? Because it's not about you or me. Thank God. It's not about us. We didn't determine the wage here. We don't determine the qualifying for it. We don't do that. He's determined this from the beginning of it. He determines this. And that's what we're seeing here. And, and, and where this was a picture in a negative, in the darkness of, of, of sin, this is the beautiful reality, the much more abounding grace of God. But the law during this time of before this grace came, before faith came, before this door came, man was here. And God put man under a law. And see, most people, and I had this question recently given to me, isn't the law just a Jewish thing? No. 
The law was over a man as long as he lives, not a Jewish man. That's why in Romans 3, Paul settles the issue and says, it doesn't matter, guys. Jew, Gentile, we're all under sin. Doesn't matter. The law condemns man. Why? Because the law testifies of another man. Now, in these chapters of chapter 5, or these verses in chapter 5, he'll go on and say, For as therefore by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Now, I, there's a, there's a, uh, a translation. This is the Weiss translation of verse 18. And I love this because it's going to get into what we're talking about in chapter 6 today. So then, therefore, as through one act of transgression to all men there resulted condemnation. Thus also through one act, look at this, one act, one man, one, of righteousness, to all men there resulted a righteous standing with God that had to do with life. I love that because if you read it in the King James, it sounds like it is a justification of my life. But when you read it in the Weiss translation, it is particular how it's worded. And it's saying it's a righteousness that has to do with life. A specific life. This life. It's a justification, a righteousness with God that has everything to do with a particular life that is present. Remember Jesus uh, or John writing about Jesus and saying this. And this is around John 3.16. We love John 3.16, but the verses around it are very important too. Where it says, he came not to the world to condemn the world. And preachers preach today, that's exactly why he came. To condemn the world and make them fear that they're going to hell. They were already there. They were already condemned. He didn't have to do it. This man already determined they were condemned because they were already in sin and death. They were already of this seed. He didn't have to condemn anybody. He came that they might be saved. And here's the problem that we think, or, or what we think in Christianity. We think salvation is to this man. That's not true. Salvation is not unto this man. It's out from this man. This is the salvation Jesus came to bring. Out from death into life. A translation from a man to another man. From, from death unto life. And it's said so many different ways through the scripture. And the problem is, because we still have this man as the reference point of our heart, we think that transaction or that translation is still a process. And still something that is going on. No, the recognition of it may be taking place in your heart, but the translation, the transaction of the Spirit of God is a once and for all act of God. And it doesn't need a further progression to be so. It needs a continual work of God to be recognized and acknowledged and, and experienced, yes, to live in the reality and realization of it. But the translation has already happened. He came for that salvation. Uh, there's many verses that say it, that he came, uh, Colossians says it, and we'll, we'll get into that in just, just a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. But he came to, that we might be saved. And, and this is the salvation that Paul is crying out for when he gives his personal account in Romans 7. He's showing this picture of two men and how God has made an absolute division between the two. Put one away and one remains. That's a clear, singular perspective. That's God's view. One. One man now determining his relationship with the soul of all who are born of this life. That's a particular beautiful, singular picture. And that's what he's describing here. But then in Romans 8 or 7, and we'll get into 6 in a moment, but then in Romans 7, he gives this personal experience 
talking about himself under the law, showing them his frustration under the law, showing the, uh, the condemnation that he was under. And you, we all know Romans 7. But he's describing to them a man who is under the law, yet attempting to be everything the law testifies of, but yet is still here. Paul says it in Romans 5 and he says it in Romans 6. Look at this. The law entered, this is verse 20 in verse chapter 5. The law entered that the offense might abound. He says in, in Romans 7 that it came so that sin could be seen to be exceedingly sinful. What does that mean? That it made him more of a sinner? That it, that it, it brought about more sin? No. That's not what it talks about at all. That's not what it's saying. The law came in as a picture of such perfection that every time I brought myself to that mirror, it showed me the depth of depravity that I was really in. It showed me the hopelessness here in myself. It showed me a, a, a hole that I was in that I couldn't get out of. And I had no way out of it. And I had to, there was no hope here. And that was one aspect of the law. It showed you the abounding abundance, the exceeding sinfulness of this state that you were in because you were born naturally. And that's what it did. Now the other aspect of the law was to show you or to declare in the midst of that a hope, an expectation of one coming, of a perfect life that would come. That's what Paul says, until faith, faith came, we were kept under the law. We were protected. Yes, condemned, shown you were not that life, but protected in a gracious expectancy for that life to come so that you would receive that life. Then that one man, that perfect life would be made unto you what was impossible here. What is impossible with man becomes possible with God. That is what the law exposed and demonstrated to the heart. It didn't make you more than you were. You were born in the depths of it. You were born there. You did, no sin you committed during your time in Adam added one measure, one part, one piece to the depth of this hole you were already in. Not one thing. That's hard for us to believe because we think the level of our great salvation is how deep the hole was we got out of. No, there's one hole and it's called Adam. And you were at the bottom of it from the time you were born. And you didn't do anything in, while you were in this man, murder, nothing. Guess what? I didn't do any of that stuff you can say is really bad stuff. And guess what? My salvation is just as real as someone who came out of that. He didn't have to bestow more grace. He bestowed the grace. And the grace was a deliverance out from the sin. That was a once and for all work. And, we, and when you realize that not one thing you did in Adam added to your depravity, added to the sinfulness that you were already in because you were born of his seed, what a wonderful reality it is when you look here and realize not one thing you do or don't do. Men like to obligate you. Men like to obligate you to religion. And most time in their obligating you to religion, they're obligating you to them. That's not here. Here, nothing you do, none of your righteous works, none of your zeal, none of your efforts, none of it adds one breath to your measure. Because your measure is the measure of another man, a perfect man who can't get better, who can't become more perfect than he already is. And that brings us in the abounding of grace that he describes in Romans 5 
to the question because he's showing them this transition has happened already from death and the life from this man to this man. That's a done deal if you're in him. So now that where sin hath reigned unto death, even so grace reign, uh, so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life in Christ Jesus the Lord. This is the much more grace that is abounded, and he's describing that as, a, as an already occurred once and for all thing. Then he asked the question in Romans 6, verses 1 and 2. So what shall we say then? In view of all this, Shall we continue in, here's the Weiss translation of it, shall we continue in the sin, not sinning, not doing things that are bad, the sin, that the grace may abound? See, what a question that is, and I misunderstood it forever, because I thought his question was, so, are we going to stop doing bad stuff or what? Isn't it time we stop doing the bad things? That's not his point at all. His point is still in context here. The question, God forbid, how shall we that are dead, dead to sin, live there any longer or remain there, continue there any longer? He's, he's describing this above and beneath uh, concept. How shall we that are here still live with this man as our daily point of reference and try to pray for God, God's grace to be bestowed upon the wrong man? To lay on our face as did Abraham and say, let Ishmael live in your sight even though you have one seed in view and that's the seed that only you can bring about. That's why he's in chapter 4, that's why he describes Abraham's impotence and deadness and Sarah's deadness and brings about faith as the understanding that he was dead and his wife's womb was dead and there was no capacity in himself to do any of the things God had said. So he believed his, the faith that he had was in reference to God's power to bring about the very thing he promised. I can't do it. It's not in my capacity. It's not in my power. So what he's saying is now that God has made the transaction from the deadness of Sarah's womb, from the deadness of Abraham, to the perfect seed that God has already brought about, shall we still he be here? Live as though this is where we are. Live as though this is our place of residence and try to pray on a daily basis for God to bestow to this man something that doesn't belong to him. Make me holy. Make me righteous. Make me. No. The cry of the Spirit is not, I'll make you. It's come and see a man who has already made unto you what you can never be. That's... The question here, it's shall we who are above look in the earth to find the evidence and the proof for anything that is only found above? Shall we implore God to bestow to this, this Ishmael the inheritance that doesn't belong to him? There's so many different pictures of this and that's what he's describing here. Should we not just let this clean cut of the work of God happen and come to comprehend it in the face of a perfect man and see righteousness as the state that he himself, that he only has determined and bestowed because he's there? Should we not just do that? Should that not be the, 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 the continual pursuing of the soul to know a present reality? Are we trying to get God to bring about something, make something happen? And in one of the verses in, in chapter 3 of Galatians, he says it this way. Uh, let, let, me, let me read it real quick. Galatians 3. Foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? 
that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? See, Paul knew that having begun in the Spirit means you have it all. If you have received the Spirit, so walk ye in Him, right? If you're in the Spirit, walk therein. Paul knew if you're in the Spirit, you're in the substance. You're in the fullness of all things. You're in God's eternal intention absolutely fulfilled. That's where you are. That's a state God has already wrought and determined and has bestowed to your soul by this gift called grace. Are you so foolish? In the light of that, having begun in that man, are you going to say now, here's the objective to perfect this man? To have some external evidence of an internal reality. And it goes even deeper than that. He says, you that have begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect in the flesh? And what he's actually saying is, will your works in the flesh, your efforts, your fleshly works and efforts actually uh, further perfect? The word in the Greek means that. To further perfect, not just perfect, but further perfect. Can you, it's what we've said, how do you add to this? You were born in, fullness is there. You can't add to this. You couldn't add to this either. Jesus says it. What man, by giving thought, can add one breath to his measure? That's true here, and that's true here. So, here's, here's the question. How do you now, having come to everything that's full, perfect, complete, bestowed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How do you now, by your flesh, further perfect that? Make that more than it is. Make it more complete than it already is because he's the completeness of it. Answer that question. And then uh, later in this chapter, after he's in the midst of contrasting basically that effort between Ishmael and Isaac, he's making that contrast between Ishmael and Isaac, and he, he, he goes back to the same, to the, basically the same questioning or thought, if you be led by the Spirit, oh, I'm sorry, this is verse 16 of chapter 5, in Galatians, this I say, walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you could not do the things that you would do. Paul in Romans 7 will describe the things that you would do. I want to do what God said to do. I want to be righteous. I want to be holy because that's what God wants. But guess what? God want, what God wants is only realized in the perfect man. That's why God never expected anything from you. Everything God expected, he bestowed in grace, in his son. That's a, I know it's hard for us to agree with that. Because see, we still look here to find evidence, to find proofs. And we look every day and someone can say, you are complete in him. I think Paul said that. You are bestowed with all fullness. Paul says that. And you look every day in your mirror or you look at your reactions in daily life and you think, ah, I can't be so. It is so because that state is determined not by you, but the one who is in you. And I know some will hear this and they'll say, well, that just breeds indifference. No, it doesn't. Not the one who's actually knowing the life that is there doesn't breed indifference. It breeds a thankfulness to God for this grace that has been bestowed and a desire to know this grace in a more perfect way. Because if you ever behold this man, 
you'll never look to this man again to find anything. Ever. Not nothing real. Nothing that God looks upon or determines things by. You'll find it right here. I found all things. Counted all things but lost for the excellency of the knowing of this man. I have found it all here. What I thought I'd found under the law in this man, I found in this man in perfect, perfect substance. So those are just you know several verses that, that go into the same thing he's saying here in Romans. And you can go to... Uh, Wednesday classes and or, or wherever to, to find those things kind of elaborated on a little more but so then the next thing God forbid how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein go to God, man. <laughs> go, here's Colossians let me just read these verses I won't stay on them long Colossians Chapter 2, just showing you, these are saying the same thing that we're familiar with other places. Right after he says this, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This is chapter 2, verse 9. You are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision. Made without hands. Notice the words. These are not one day will be. You will be circumcised. You will be sanctified. You are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of sins of the flesh. Here's the body of sin. That's the body of sins. That's what you've put off because you've come to this man. This man is now your clothing. You have put this man on. It's very important that we realize, James says it, two things can't dwell in the same thing place. Bitter and sweet can't be in the same fountain. Right? But every day we convince ourselves it is. So we're steadily trying to get God to cast that bitter out of the fountain. And he's like, what bitter and which fountain are you looking at? What sin and which man is your reference point? That's the question. Because if this is a once and for all work of God, then it's a once and for all work of God. It's just a work of God that has to be known, recognized, experienced. But even if you don't know it, it's as real as it's ever going to be. That's the, that's the security of this. That's the anchor that holds you even when you don't know the anchor's there. Remember we, we read it, I think during the conference we were talking about that. That even when we do not believe, yet he abides faithful because he cannot deny himself. And in the in a original translation, I can't remember the translation I was reading, maybe the Weiss or the Young's Literal. It said this, He abides faithful because, even in our unbelief, he abides faithful because he cannot cease being who he is. Now that's awesome. Even when I'm ignorant, if he's in me, he can't cease being who he is in me. And you can't mess that up either. Because you didn't determine who he was or who he is in you in the first place. If he's there, he's there. The question is, are you knowing the one who's there? Are you still looking here to find the evidence of something that he is? That's the only question. It's not. Paul in the midst, look at who he wrote to for God's sake. Look at some of the conditions of the people. Christians, churches that he wrote to. Look at the things they were dealing with. Look at what they were, he was having to correct. It wasn't just theological things he was having to correct with some of them. And he never questioned their salvation, did he? 
They ever say, you need to be born again, don't you? No, he said, you need to see the Lord. You need to see the one who is your life. And then this man won't be a problem because he'll never be in the picture again because he's not there to begin with. Death is not where life is. Darkness is not where light is. Come and see a man. That's the cry of, of the Spirit. Um, so here's the, here, here he goes on. In the, it says in another place, Jesus, Jesus was crucified. Jesus died. I can't remember the exact wording of it. That he might destroy the body. Of death. Now has that happened or not? The word destroyed is a pretty strong word. And if he died for that to be so. To say it is not so. Is to say he died in vain. It is so. The body of death is destroyed. The body of sins is put away. One. Remain. This is the beauty of this. So, uh, anyway, the, the whole thing, you're being dead to this, being dead to it. He says it very plainly again in Colossians 2 at the end, right before he begins the above and beneath uh, thing in chapter 3 that we know about, talk about, he says this, since you're dead... Why are you held or why are you still under these things like touch not, taste not, handle not? That's applicable only here. Because it's to demonstrate to this man that he can't, he can't do anything but touch, taste. <laughs> because he, that, he's everything contrary to this. You say thou shalt not, and he is the thing you shall not do. It's not just he does it. James says it. You do everything perfectly and you offend in one point of the law, you're guilty of the whole thing. Why? Because you're the one point that offends it. That's how Paul can say in Philippians 3, I was blameless touching the righteousness in the law. Right? And yet the same man, it wasn't because he had a bad day. Romans 7 can say, wretched man that I am. Every time I try to do the good, the law says, evil is present. How can you say both? Because both are true. Because I can do perfectly what it says, but I cannot be the perfect one of whom it testifies. So guess what God did? He made it so you wouldn't have to worry about making that transition. If you're born of the seed of a perfect man, this trans, that transition has already happened. So it's not now you trying to make perfect works the same as perfect life. Now you have a perfect life. And we're going to see here how that beautifully, to me, parallels to this victory that he speaks of in 1 Corinthians 15. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. His death. What's his death? Death to sin. Dead to sin. That's the baptism. And we'll talk, we've talked about that in other classes. Like I said, I don't have time this morning to get into all that. But Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be of resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. 
that the body of sin might be destroyed. There it is. That the body of sin might be destroyed. Do you think that's still something happening? No. Absolutely not. That henceforth we should not serve sin or be governed, be the bond slaves of sin. Again, don't think of sin as things we do. He's not speaking of that. He's talking about sins as a state of being determined by a seed, by a man, by a kind of man. So I want to talk just for whatever time I have left. I'm not sure. There you go. Thank you, sir. Uh, about this walking in newness of life. And I believe this is what he's addressing in 1 Corinthians 15. Because, again, we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing that this man is crucified, that the body of sin might be destroyed. All that's so important because of what he says in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's turn there uh, just for a little bit. Peter says, when he talks about the flood, Noah, he says that this baptism that he just talks about in Romans 6, baptized with Christ, baptized in his death, he says it very like this. He says, in this picture he's going to talk about with Noah, he said, our baptism, baptism doth now save us. And he goes into the picture of of how Noah, the flood, does away with an entire creation. Puts away an entire creation and Noah only remains. And those that are with him. He says eight souls in in, uh, Peter, but it says in Genesis, Noah only remained and those that were with him. So, and he says, this is a picture of the baptism that doth now save us. What has he done? Remember that we are crucified. The old man is crucified that the body of sin might be destroyed. This, when you're talking about Noah and the flood, you're talking about the same thing. A destruction of an entire creation. An destruction of an entire man in picture, in testimony. He said, this is a picture of the baptism that we now have. That is our salvation that saves us. He said, and this baptism is not what we imagine it to be, cleaning this up, like the filth of the flesh, just cleaning it off, making it better. But it is a good conscience unto God by the resurrection. A conscience is a word that means your knowledge is joined to something. In the Greek, it means knowledge being joined to. So when when your understanding, when the understanding of your heart is joined to, there's the good conscience. Now it's joined to that which is perfect. This living, risen one. Now it is not upon uh, Hebrews contrast, the good conscience and evil conscience. One has this man in view, one has this man in view. God has this man in view. That's why God's faith is never rattled. What if we don't believe? Will it change the faith of God? No, absolutely not. Let God be true and every man a liar. So, this is the the baptism that has saved us. And it is to bring us to a good conscience by the resurrection. And this is what the resurrection is. It's one man living. Noah only remained. Everything else gone. And one man who is righteous in the sight of God, remains. And if you're found in Him, salvation is secured. 
This is the reality of our baptism. This is the reality of our salvation. Let's go into some of these verses. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how shall some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain and, our, and your faith is also vain, empty. And we are found false witnesses of God. Thanks, sir. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. And if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And he's making this as a very, he's strongly trying to make a point here. If Christ is not raised, the dead cannot be raised. Okay? And if Christ be not raised, verse 17, your faith is vain and you are yet in your sins. Because the deliverance from this death and sin and this man, this state, is absolutely dependent on one man being raised. One man living. One man raised out from among the dead by the glory of the Father. And if that be not so, then you can say all you want, but you're still here. Because when you receive him, you've received Resurrection, you've received a life that has no reference to this, an altogether new life where there is no sin, a salvation without sin in it. We see that? That's what we receive. A salvation without sin has no reference point here. It's this man, all and in all, perfect, unadulterated, And you are yet in your sins. Now, we won't get into all of these verses uh, right now. We only have a little over ten, under 10 minutes. For since by faith, uh, since by man came death, this is what he says in uh, chapter 5 of Romans, verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Now, some translations say, Amen. Verse 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Same thing he says in Romans. Now, let's look at, don't have a lot of time to get into these. So, verse 35, let's, let's jump there. Some, some man will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body did they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. That which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it pleased him to every seed his own body. And then he begins to make this contrast that all flesh is not the same, all bodies are not the same, they're celestial bodies, terrestrial bodies, and all of that. And then this brings him to his contrast that he's actually trying to make because this is the contrast that he's talking about. This has everything to do with not being in your sin any longer. Uh, the resurrected one, and your, your faith is not being in vain. It has to do with if this Transaction, the very thing in chapter 15 that the church is still trying to dispensationalize and tell you has not happened yet. If this be not happened and not be so presently, you're still in your sin. If Jesus being raised was just a down payment for our resurrection one day, then we're still in our sin. Because unless the resurrection lives in you, you don't have the newness of life. Romans 5 talks about, therefore, you're not saved. And you have no relationship with God. So, first, uh, 
42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. That's here. This is what was sown. And is raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body. There is a spiritual body. So it is written. The first man was made a living soul. The last Adam, a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. And as is the earthy, such are they that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. That's Jesus saying in John, those that are born of the flesh are flesh. That's it. You don't, you don't graduate to the next level there. You're there, and that's where you are. And he's going to say that here, too. And again, let's not dispensationalize it. I'm not even talking about eschatology. I'm talking about just salvation. Let's not dispensationalize it and make it a progression of acquiring of certain things. Let's realize if the resurrection and the life's in us, this is absolute. This is so. That is something we reckon, as he says in Romans 5, reck, or 6, reckon this to be so, but it is so. That's why it's there to be reckoned or acknowledged, because it is so. That's the ground upon which we stand. It's very solid. Very, very solid. Very secure. Because he secures it. He can't cease being who he is. Even when you can't cease being who you are, he can't cease being who he is. See, that's too much rope for some people, right? <laughs> All right, so as, uh, as we are born the image of the earthy, so she also, also bear the image of the heavenly. Now, in a lot of these places, you can look it up, a lot of these places where it says the shall, 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 these are not future tense things. These are... Definite. A lot of them in the Aorist tense where it sees the whole thing as a reality, is done. Uh, you have to look at, look at it. Uh, we don't have time to go through every verse with that. But shall, he's using, in a lot of these, he's using the, the, the language of the prophets because a lot of this is in the prophets, what he's saying here. He's using their language, but he's describing their language as fulfilled in this work where God has brought us from one man to another. Where we come from the earthly to the, to the heavenly, from the man of the earth to the man of the spirit. That's what he's describing here. So, I love this verse. Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, and this shoots religion right in the head and it just keeps on rolling. This I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So religion says, I get, uh, here's how we're going to get around that. We're going to have glorified bodies. <laughs> He's already said there's a body that's glorified. It's already a glorified body. You're either in that body or not. If you're in that body, this is still so. Flesh and blood cannot inherit this. Remember Ishmael? He will not have an inheritance with, this, with, the, with my son. Cast him out, him and his mother. He cannot be the heir here. It's, it's, this is the picture. Flesh and blood will not, you don't acquire it, you never get it. It's not something you qualify for in the future by if you're good enough or you work hard enough. No, never. Cannot. That's a big word. Cannot. Ever learning, but never able. To come to the knowledge of the truth, that's another cannot. The natural man cannot know these things. Why? They're spiritually discerned. It shuts you out of here. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom that belongs to the Son. Neither corruption inherit incorruption. And wrong, 
Romans 7 shows a man that's trying to get that to happen. In his own personal experience. He's saying I was trying to get in corruption to inherit incorruption. Trying to get more mortality to inherit immortality. And I had to realize that that which is flesh is flesh and always will be. It's another life, another seed, a righteousness that is determined by a particular life that God has given. That's what I have to know. Because that's what God has given in His Son. That's salvation. This is not a process. This is so. And I'm, behold, I show you a mystery. Here's the mystery. Christ in you, right? <laughs> we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Yes, absolutely. That's what happened. In a moment. Twinkling of an eye. Moment. That's, that's how fast this happened. And we're still saying, it's coming, it's a coming, it's a coming. I remember, even being in this fellowship, I remember hearing all the people when I first came around, they said, one day we're going to get to this. We're coming to a place. And I thought, what place are we coming to? I didn't know anything, and I was st that just frustrated me because I'm thinking, what's the difference between this then and this dispensational stuff that I came out of, if we're still coming to it? No. This is speaking of something that's come to you. That is by the grace of God as the gift bestowed to the soul. Moment. Twinkling of an eye, last trump. Trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. We shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. When did that happen? Is that still something we're working toward? No. That is a reality that happened. When? When you were born of incorruptible seed. See, what we think is we're born of the incorruptible seed and one day this will be incorruptible. This body. So we think that's what God's after now, this body. No, this is what God was after and this is what he's always after and this is what is absolutely so presently. The immortal has put on it, immortality. Corruption has put on Go through the other letters of Paul. He says it. You have put on the new man. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, he's showing when this is so, this is so. Let's look at this. So when this corruption have put on incorruption, the mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death, remember, death came because of one man's sin. Death is swallowed up in victory. And here is the victory that overcometh the world. Even our faith. Sting of death is sin. The strength of sin. So oh, I'm sorry, verse 55. Oh death, where is thy sting? Oh grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. If this is a dispensational thing, what's the law doing here? This is not relating to the very thing Romans is relating to. Why is the law even mentioned? Because the law is over a man as long as he lives. And this will take us into Romans 8, and this is just what Paul will say, and Romans 8 will say too, that if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And that has, that's, that's a tremendous thing. 57, verse 57, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the victory. When did that happen? Oh, it hadn't happened yet. You better hope it's happened. 
Because if you refer all this back to the beginning of this chapter, where it says, if this, not, if this isn't so, your faith is vain, our preaching vain, and you're still in sin. You better hope it's so. This is the victory that we have. This is the victory that Romans 7 will describe. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the very same thing. Because the victory is not I, but Christ. And all the dispensationalizing we can do will not change that that's the victory. And, they, and we come into that victory the moment the one who won the victory comes into us and brought it about. And he determines this state. And it's our growing in the knowledge, our understanding of this. Absolutely that is true. We must. What I'm saying is the thing that we are desiring to know. Is the knowing of it is not what secures it. The presence of it secures it. And that gives us a sure basis to know to experience and to pursue the knowledge of. All right. Thank you, Father, for this time. Let us, let us not just hear words today. Let us set our hearts to know a present, perfect, absolute reality that is determined by the presence of the perfect man. Thank you for it. Amen. All right, guys. We're done. Thanks for being with us, everyone.